Hello, I'm Willie George. I want to welcome you to this edition of the Faith Roots Podcast. And we're talking about the spiritual man. And this is episode number seven. I don't know how many of these we're going to wind up doing. We're going to do it till I feel like I've exhausted the subject, so it could go for a little while. But I want to turn you to our text, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. I want to recap just a minute. A natural person is a person who does not know how to receive revelation knowledge. Keep in mind that knowledge comes to us in two ways, through our senses, the five physical senses, seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, smelling, okay? And and that's a wonderful thing. We learn a lot about this world that we live in by those five physical senses, but that limits us in our ability to know and to understand God because God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And spiritual revelation comes in another way. Now the Bible says that we can't know the things of God unless we're spiritual. They're spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual discerns all things. In other words, he has the ability to evaluate circumstances and situations that he finds himself in to know what God's will is. Now David... When he went out to face Goliath, even though he was only 17 years old, had enough revelation knowledge to know that he would win. And there was a reason for it. David had wrapped himself up in the covenant that God had made with Abraham, that God reinforced with Isaac, with Jacob, and then ultimately with Moses. David had wrapped himself up in the covenant. And when he went out to fight Goliath, David was convinced of a supernatural component. Now this is so critical. David knew that God would respond supernaturally because it was how God began the covenant relationship that he had with Israel. I want to read to you from Genesis chapter 17. We're going to read a few verses here and then go to Genesis 18. When Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me, be thou perfect. I will make my covenant between me and thee. I will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Future tense. But then he changes tense right here in verse 5. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. Now God said, I have done it. God said, I just did it. I have made this happen. Then I want you to see in verse 15 what he said about Sarah. God said unto Abraham, as for Sarai, her, uh, his wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. Sarai means my princess. It, was, it would be what a dad could say to his little girl, you're my princess. But God changed her name to princess, which means she's everybody's princess, not just one person's princess. This is no longer a family thing. This is a, an earth thing, earth-wide thing. I will bless her. I will give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations, kings of people shall be of her. And Abram fell on, or Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to him who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear? And skip down to verse 19. God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him. And this is for an everlasting covenant with a seed after him. So see, David knew that's my covenant. I have a supernatural covenant, and this covenant began in power. It began supernaturally. Now, next chapter, God comes back for another visit, and he says to Abram or Abraham in Genesis 18, 9, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. He said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah, thy wife, shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. 
Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the men of women. She'd already gone through menopause. She wasn't uh, generating an egg every month. She had no possible way of bearing a child. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I'm waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord? Being old also, neither one of us is capable of, of parenting children. And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child, which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Now this is awesome. This is how God began His first covenant with people. This first covenant with people through Abraham was begun supernaturally. Since Israel was brought into existence supernaturally, God is going to sustain them supernaturally. God sustains His covenant people by the same ways and by the same forces that He gave birth to them. Listen to me. If we don't believe in the supernatural for any other reason, it should be because of this spiritual law. And it is, and it's a law throughout the Scriptures. How God begins is how He sustains, and it's how He ends. He doesn't begin something in one way and then completely abandon that. He keeps going with it. And David knew that. He expected supernatural help because God had given supernatural help for the very beginning of the children of Israel. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Now Jesus reinforces this idea. This is 2,000 years later. And you can see the same thing is still working. Okay, look at the book of Mark chapter 4 verse 35. And the same day, when the evening was come, Jesus said to them, Let us pass over to the other side. So he got them into boats. They were on the, the Sea of Galilee. And he establishes a purpose for that mission. And that mission is, we're going to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And he tells them to get into boats for this purpose. Let us pass over to the other side. Now, God always gives a purpose in the beginning. God gave a purpose to the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt and they came back into the land of Canaan and, and uh, Moses sent out spies to find out how to take the land. But 10 of the spies said, we can't do it. But Caleb never lost sight of the purpose. Numbers 13, 30, look at what he said. He stilled the people before Moses and he said, let us go up at once and possess it for we are well able to overcome it. What's he saying? He's saying, look, this is God's purpose. If it's God's purpose, then we can do it. We can do anything that God has purposed. If we can, if it's His purpose, if Jesus said, let us pass over to the other side, then we're going to pass over to the other side. Now, these ten spies dominated the thinking of the people, and the people languished in unbelief, and they stayed in the wilderness for 40 years, and none of them possessed the land. But God extended the lifespans of the two men who were full of faith, and that would have been Joshua, and it would have been Caleb. And the Bible says in Joshua 15, 14, 40 years after Caleb uttered those words, we are well able to overcome it. 40 years later, the Bible says, from Hebron, Caleb drove out the three Anakites, uh, Shishai, Ahahimon, and Talmai, forgive me for butchering those Hebrew names, they were the descendants of Anak, but they, they were giants. And Caleb, 40 years later, when he was an old man, he went up and he took out these giants and he drove them out. Now this is awesome. Nobody can stop you when you believe God. Nobody can stop you. Caleb was still fighting giants. And let me tell you why this is important. Because in the neighborhood, there would come just a few hundred years later, in the neighborhood, there's going to be a shepherd boy that grows up that reads about these things, and he meditates the Torah, and he thinks about these things. And Caleb's story, no doubt, is one of the things that is etched into his mind. And I'm talking about David. It affected him and the way he thought about battle, because he knew that how God begins is how God sustains, is how God ends. All right, now, 
They got into the boat, back to Mark 4. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind. And the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. Now what you've got here is a direct attack of Satan on the purpose and the mission of God. Jesus said, we're going to the other side. Satan says, no, you're not. I'm going to stop it. And so if Jesus of Nazareth in his earthly walk here on this earth, is opposed by satanic forces and the winds and the waves came against him, don't you think the devil will try and challenge you? Of course he will. He'll do everything in his power to try to challenge you, but that doesn't mean it will be accomplished. So uh, these guys lost sight of the purpose for a moment. And the Bible says, as Jesus was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, they awake him and they say to him, Master, care us not that we perish. We're going to die, they said. What happened? They lost sight of the purpose of God. Jesus didn't say, let's get in. Let's go out to the middle of the sea. I'm going to take a nap. And while I'm asleep, I'm going to forget about you. And all of you guys are going to drown. We're all going to die out here because of this storm. That isn't what happened. He established a purpose. And then the Bible says, he arose, he rebuked the wind. He said to the sea, peace be still. What's he doing? He's bringing it back into alignment with the purpose. The purpose was to cross the sea. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And then he asks them this question, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, what manner of man is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. Now, that's great that they asked that question, but really they should have been focused on the question that Jesus asked them. Why are you so fearful, and how is it that you have no faith? If they had stopped to think about that, they would have known how to answer that question. They would have said, well, the reason we had no faith is because we did not consider the beginning purpose of our mission. Now, this is a spiritual law, and when you wrap your mind around this, it will affect you in everything you do the rest of your life. And that is how God begins, is how God sustains, and how God finishes. God is the God of a full circle. The book of Isaiah tells us that when Christ returns, he's going to establish a paradise on the earth. Why is that? It is because God began with a paradise. But do you know this? Even in this life, you and I are to pray that the will of God God be done in planet earth as it is in heaven. So what we see is the beginning of God's paradise, a sustenance, a sustaining of God's paradise, and an ending of God's paradise. That's God's purpose. That's his mission. Now, it was this precise argument, this very argument, that established the New Testament church. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. That's what Paul preached in Colossians chapter 1. Now, now there was an argument that, that rose up, and people said there is no resurrection of the dead. And this is how the apostle Paul defeats it. Now, I'm only going to read one verse here, but, but the whole chapter of 1 Corinthians 15 is given to this argument. Why the dead have to be raised? And Paul asks this one question in verse 16, 1 Corinthians 15. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ is not raised either. Now what does that mean? It means, guys, how God begins is how he ends. If he began the church with a supernatural resurrection, the raising of Jesus from the dead, then he has to raise the dead at the end of the age. When the time has come, he has to raise the dead because the church was begun with the raising of the dead. If the first covenant began with a supernatural birth, then the second covenant has to include a supernatural birth. And we see it in the birth of the firstborn from the dead. Jesus is the first one to be raised with a glorified body. Other people were raised from the dead, but not with glorified bodies. Jesus was the first one to get a body that would never again be subject to death. And you know what? 
the way you and I enter this family of God that we're called to be a part of is through a supernatural birth. We are literally, not figuratively, not symbolically, we are literally born again. We get a brand new spirit because that's how this covenant began. It began with a supernatural birth, and it is sustained by a supernatural birth, and it ends in a supernatural birth. In fact, if you read the book of Revelation, you see that God creates a new heaven and a new earth. It's how He began, and it's how He ends. And in between, He sustains. So David had great faith when he went out to fight Goliath. He knew he was going to win because he knew he would have supernatural power. And he knew he would have supernatural power because he knew it was the way of the covenant. And since he was part of the covenant family of Abraham, living in the territory that God had promised Abraham, he knew that Caleb, who was a descendant of Abraham through the tribe of Judah, he knew that Caleb ran off giants and defeated those giants in his own neighborhood. He knew that giants could be beaten. He knew that it happened before in Israel's history. He expected that it would happen again. Goliath and every last one of his brothers, four of them, five all told, four brothers and Goliath make five. Every one of those giants was taken out by David's family, David's mighty men, and by David himself. They defeated them all because it was how God began. So I want to ask you a question. How did God begin you? How did you begin? What did he say to you in the beginning? What is your beginning? You see, God gave you great... Listen, any of us, when we come into the kingdom, God puts something of a great expectation in us. We know instinctively He's got a plan for me. He has a purpose for me. There's something wonderful that He wants to do. God didn't start you that way just to leave you in defeat. He wants to finish you that way. And a spiritual person has the ability to see the supernatural power of God. I, I believe in it. I expect it. I don't know how. And I don't have to know how. All I have to know is it is my heritage. God will deliver me in a, a wonderful and an amazing way. Well, that is all the time we have for this particular episode, but we're not done. So you stick with me and we will finish this out and we'll stay with it as long as it takes for us to establish what does it mean to be a spiritual man. Thank you very much. <laughs>